Well, 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 welcome, welcome, welcome once again to another Wednesday night webinar. Good to be with all of you. Thanks for being here. Hey, Stacy, quick, what the heck? How are you? Hi, I'm excited to be here. I, I see you on my webinar. Always exciting to have a fellow no CD therapist on with me and uh, one so well known due to your memes and all sorts of other fantastically fun and exciting things that you uh you love to do out there in the world so thanks thanks for uh thanks for joining tonight and um just a couple of things for everybody as we get people coming in here tonight's webinar brought to you by no cd no cd a downloadable app you can get through google play or ios so please feel free to check us out and of course, if you're looking for teletherapy, we have that available throughout the United States and lots of insurances that cover us as well, too. We're also available in Canada, the United Kingdom, and in Australia as well. And if you're looking for treatment for OCD, we got that covered. But we also do work on hoarding and body-focused repetitive behaviors such as trichotillomania and excoriation and tics as well. And we also provide education sessions for people as well too so if you have a friend or a family member who has ocd and you're interested in getting some education about that please feel free to reach out to us and we'll set up a no cd 411 session for you as well too all right i think that's most of my intro -y stuff so um it's always fun to have a guest number one and then someone like stacy who has been very open about your OCD journey and your story. And it's been featured a lot here at No CD. And I think it's amazingly inspiring for people. So I'm always full of gratitude when someone wants to come in and talk from both sides of the coin here tonight, who is an OCD therapist, but who has also had to deal with OCD and understands what it's like to go through therapy as well too and come out the other end and then really devote your life to doing what you can to help other people who have this condition as well too. So Stacy, quick, welcome. Thank to you. Tonight webinar. How are you tonight? Good. Such a great introduction. I don't even know if I can follow that up. Um, All right. Well, we're done, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, it's been we're a great done. Webinar. Everyone <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> Oh, if only it were that easy. No. Um, yeah, no, I have appreciated um, having a platform to share my story. Um, you wouldn't probably realize this, but I've only uh, only in the last year and a half sh ever shared my story really with mm -hmm. anyone. Um, and then it's like once you start, you can't seem to stop. So, um, yeah, yeah, I've had it for 36 years. Um, that I remember probably longer because that's the earliest memory I have. Um, yeah. And then only in the last year, year and a half, two years started talking about it. So that's been kind of nice aside from when I did my own ERP therapy, of course, but yeah. So you've done ERP. You've been very open about doing ERP. Um, what yeah. has your experience of ERP been like? And I think that, again, it's always interesting to hear from someone who now has other people do ERP to talk about their own experience of going through it themselves. Yeah, it's it's been a wild ride. It's been over 20 years ago since I did ERP. So, of course, wow. it's come it's mm -hmm. come a long, long ways. I think I was 21 or 22 when I had ERP. And um, um, I wish it was as, as organized and as... Um, as nice as NoCD does it. I don't know how else to put it. Um, NoCD is just very well organized with it and it seems to be very quick and effective. And, and when I did it, it was for a lot longer than what I see people get better with here. So um, yeah, yeah, it's been a journey. I would have never went into this field and did the work I did had I not had that experience. Um, I was, I went, I ended up going back to school after my, uh, or kind of mid therapy. So um, I wasn't on this path for sure uh, until, until I got treatment. So yeah, it's been exciting and it's nice to see um, 
other people and give them hope that, you know, hopefully they'll get to a place where they're living in recovery. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, maybe for those who wonder what, what is recovery? What does recovery feel like? Right. How do you, how do you describe recovery to people? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think it looks different for everybody. You know, I can only, can only kind of say what my journey has been, which is, um, life is a lot easier now than it used to be is the simplest way to put it. You know, how I kind of tell people is, uh, ERP and, and all the work I've done has helped me to filter, um, things much easier. It's helped me to recognize, um, I'm not my thoughts and I can do things in spite of what I'm thinking or feeling and it's living life again. You know, there were so many years where you don't live life, you're kind of stuck. And so for me, it's just living life again. That's awesome. Of course, we would want everyone to be able to live life, right? I mean, that that's really, really where we're looking. What can we get people to do to really, to really be able to live life. So, so that is fantastic. I'm thrilled to hear that for you. And, um, how about though, is there any ever like that backdoor spike, you know, that, that aspect of, of OCD wants to try to creep back in again or anything of that nature? Yeah. I think that's one of the things I get a lot is, you know, well, does that mean it's gone or does that mean, you know, you're, free of all the symptoms. And I think, no, you know, sadly, I hate, I I believe somebody could be, I suppose. I've, I've never seen somebody where OCD has gone away. Um, but it could happen, I suppose. Um, not, not me, of course. Um, mine has always stuck around. Um, and I suspect it'll be there until the day that I die. Um, but it's manageable, you know, it's, it's not something that's on my mind every single day. I mean, I remember, um, especially in my twenties, just that was my life was OCD. Now it's a small fraction of my life. And I've seen that with lots of members I've worked with too, where, you know, it was debilitating and it took up all of their time. And then they've gotten to a place where, you know, it, it's, it's still there, but it's such a little part. That's awesome. Well, as we love to do, we love to kind of get in and uh, check out some questions from people and everything. So uh, very, very happy to have you here to kind of join me on on the uh, the Q and a part of of the work that we would do. so so let's uh, let's kind of check out and see some of the things that people are saying out there and uh, let's let's have a fun discussion. So Stephanie talks about. Uh, Ever hear of, of obsessions over not being able to remember things? Sure. <laughs> All the time. Uh, in fact, just this morning with Chris Tronson, I did a IOCDF uh, live lunch and learn with him about real event and false memory OCD. So uh, always, you know, something around memory can absolutely be there in OCD. So Stephanie says, my brain is constantly sending me questions about previous events or images, which I feel a sense of urgency to recall. Most of the time I can come up with an answer, but when I can't, my brain has a really hard time letting it go. Has this been an area ever for you that you've dealt with yourself or because I, you know, if it is, and believe me, you, you tell us as much as you want about your own kind of experience, but I think it's always great if somebody comes on and has had this kind of experience that they can share that with other folks as well too. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that is often the root of a lot of OCD is this idea that I can't trust my own memory or I can't trust some part of me, right? Trouble recalling the doubt, you know, I'm not sure it happened just like this or not. Um, I've definitely had my own experiences with that. Um, One of the things when I first went into treatment is I was kind of convinced I was like, I must have had trauma, like there must be buried trauma within me. That's why I have these weird thoughts. And that's why I have OCD, right? And they're like, well, 
what would have happened to you? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> I'm like, but I've heard that, you know, you don't have to remember to have had trauma. So, you know, me and my therapist, we kind of went back and forth for a while. And he said, well, what is the very worst thing that could have happened? And I said, well, of course, I probably was molested. You know, of course, that's the most horrible thing I could think of. And, and they're like, and you don't remember. And I said, no, I don't remember that. I said, but it could have happened. And they're like, it, it could have happened. Sure. And they said, and then, and then what, you know, and then, so we've kind of played this out and long story short, they were basically, my therapist got me to see, you're still you. It's the same thing, whether it happened or didn't happen. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't change anything. Um, but I think that's what OCD does, right? It just wants any grain of anything to hang on to that I have to be sure. You know, it doesn't really, nobody's sure that you haven't had a buried memory. It's just that most people can filter that out. Whereas somebody with OCD gets stuck and says, you know, I'm not sure. And I don't know. I can't move past this. I need, I need to know, you know. Yeah, boy, that need to know experience is so very common among people, right? But that idea yeah. that I can't live in a world without knowing something or without a guarantee about this this very thing. I can live in a world that has all sorts of doubt about all sorts of other things. But if there's doubt about this one thing right here, this very thing, I can't function until we figure out a way to make sure that there is no doubt about that thing. So if we could just first get rid of all the doubt about that thing, that would be awesome. And then we'll go ahead and we'll go back to this other thing. And and how amazingly difficult it is to live uh, in, in a world that you think should provide you absolutes and answers to things. Well, and I want to say you, your OCD thinks that you should be provided those kinds of things. Yeah, when, yeah. When no one, no one can actually get that, right? Yeah, I mean, at that point in my life, I would have rather they just said, yes, you were. And then I had an answer, you know, mm -hmm. it, it made sense, right? Like, okay, that's a reason why you're suffering, you know? And so, yeah, yeah it just wanted an answer. But I'm also glad that someone just didn't tell you that to, so that it could appease yeah, to yeah, OCD. Me too. Right? And, in retrospect, yes. Yeah, because <laughs> then, you know, then OCD would have taken that another area as well, too. So I think that's that's one of the trickeries of OCD. If you could just tell me the answer to this, then I'll be fine. Yeah. What it doesn't tell you is that then that opens a trap door to the next thing that you have to have an answer to. And then the next thing that you have to have an yes. answer to, and it just kind of goes and goes. And it has jumped, let me tell you, so many themes. I, I couldn't even... Couldn't even begin to tell you over 36 years how many different thoughts you have. I wouldn't even try because it would be very long and painful. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it will. It will latch onto something else, right? Once you get certainty about that or you think you do, it just switches. You know, it's like um, I was talking to somebody the other day uh, who had some relationship fears and they were like, you know, if I if I just break up with this person, then, you know, I can move on and I'll know that it wasn't the right person. But then, you know, what would happen is it would just be I've just lost the love of my life. You know, now I can't go on. It would just flip flop because that that's what it does. Yeah. It's like a bad politician. Just flip flops. Right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's a Love's, lawyer. Love that. Sorry. Sorry to you lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh these please do not accept these as views of no yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was all me. Sorry. <laughs> bad experiences. <laughs> Kayla Brooks says, Hi, Dr. Patrick. Uh, can any theme created by pure OCD be recovered, even those that cause delusions or hallucinations? You know, uh, Kayla, I I would always say that it never hurts to talk to a therapist to see where you're at with, with whatever kind of theme you've got going on. And don't forget that there's also some great medications that are out there that can potentially very be very helpful for obsessive compulsive disorder as well. And uh, there's even other procedures that are starting to become available for OCD as well too. So um, I, I don't ever lose hope on being able to help someone with obsessive compulsive disorder. Cool. VA girls got a couple things here. Let me just kind of uh, get a synopsis going on that, Stacy. Uh, so, hello, Dr. McGrath. Thanks for being here. Uh, some signs and symptoms of pediatric OCD uh, for your eight year old son. He's got some stories that are involving sexual content and cartoon characters and everything like that. He wants to be told he's a good boy. You've talked to him about safe touching and strangers. Um, 
There's a lot of confessing that he's doing. You yourself started to have violent sexual in, uh, intrusive thoughts around his age about a family member, and there was no abuse whatsoever. So, um, well, again, VA girl and and Stacy, you know, it sounds like you're a great answer on this one as well, too, in the sense that, you know, what happens when you've got OCD starting in someone who's young, right? And And I would say, VA girl, if you've got, a history of this yourself. Um, you know, we do know from a genetic point of view that if you've got OCD, there's a greater than average chance for your child to have OCD as well, just due to the genetic component of this kind of thing. So uh, it, it never hurts at this point to do a reach out to a therapist to get an evaluation going. But Stacy, your, your thoughts on this? Yeah, one. yeah. One of my first memories, honestly, one of my very first compulsions was confessing to my mom. My mom was my safe person and I would tell her everything. And I know there were times she thought, what a little wacko I have. Mm -hmm. um, but but that, that really was, and I had no idea that's what it was, but that went on for years and years. So that's always a red flag to me. Like if kids are saying, you know, even, even things that are, not sexual in nature, right? It could be anything. For me, it was, you know, if I thought I lied or if I thought I said something bad. I mean, my brother to this day tells a story about, um, this is weird, but I'll tell you it because I've already started to. <laughs> um, but we had this like pile of wood in our yard for our fire, like for our um, fireplace. And mm -hmm. my brother one day was like, hey, let's go up on that pile of wood and swear and we'll call it the swear pile. And to this day, I, I don't know why we did that. We're Weird, weirdos, but whatever. Mm. Um, we did. And then I felt so much guilt. I'm not even sure I said anything, if I'm being honest. This is that memory thing. I probably didn't. Mm -hmm. But I know my brother did because he doesn't care about that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I immediately told my parents and he got in big trouble because he was older and knew better. And so I say that because anytime a kiddo is coming to you and kind of saying like things that most kids wouldn't tell you, to me, that's kind of a red flag, you know? Um, just that something might be going on in terms of OCD. And then the second part I want to say is I also used to specialize before no CD in child sexual abuse. And so um, it never hurts to, uh, you know, just get an, a full assessment. You know, they'll assess for that. It's pretty um, common to do that kind of assessment and, and sort out what's OCD and what might be something else. But also, you know, it, it very likely is OCD if it, if it runs in your family. So, yeah. Yeah, and she even made mention there. There's no indication of abuse or anything as well, yeah. too. So hopefully that's you know, that's where we're at. And good thing is we've got great treatments even for the young kids to be able to Absolutely. work on this as well, too. Smurfette says, "I lose sleep worrying that a loud noise may happen, like a dog bark and other neighborhood noises that occur. How do I get control of my anticipatory anxiety?" Well, I, I've had people wish for the opposite. So I've had people go to sleep and say, boy, I hope tonight there's a very loud noise that wakes me up and then go to bed, right? And and practice it. You know, we've, we've seen other people who have similar kinds of fears, people who have said, you know, I, I can't go to sleep unless I've emptied my bladder entirely. So therefore, what I need to do is stay up all night and try to make sure that I have no urine left in me so that if when I do go to sleep, then I won't have to wake up and go to the bathroom. Well, guess what? <laughs> then you don't sleep at all, which then becomes the very thing that you are afraid of. You've created by staying up all night, trying to make sure that you have no urine in you. Now you don't go to sleep. And yeah, that's yeah. ultimately what you fear. So OCD loves to try to make the thing that you're afraid of happen just in, an, in like a slightly different way. And, and uh, it's, it's that back, kind of behind the back punch you in the head type of type of experience going on here right yeah um, i love the name smurfette i gotta say but awesome. on a side yeah. note i would purposely play really loud things or i would get like a partner involved or a friend and have them purposefully come over at night and like make a lot of lo loud noises because really you want to tell your you, you want your brain to see oh that happened the worst happened and nothing else happened right the worst that would happen is you'd wake up and then you know you'd go back to sleep or eventually, right? Or not. And then you'd cross that bridge when you get there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that one of the things you would definitely work on with a therapist, Murphat, is, you know, what, what if you did wake up? Then what? And the fear probably, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but the fear probably is something around, well, then what if I can't fall back asleep? Okay. But here's what we know. 
everything starts with those two words of what if, right? And so a lot of the work that we're doing in OCD is to really challenge those what if experiences and allow you to realize that just because you can think of a what if doesn't mean that you have to be afraid of a what if. What ifs yeah. don't have to rule your life and be in charge of everything, but OCD sure likes to make sure that they are. I, yeah, I, I love that because in 36 years, maybe one of my 5 million what ifs has actually come true. And when it did, I handled it and, and life goes on, you know, um, but one out of 5,000 is pretty good. Pretty good numbers. Yeah. I'll take those odds, right? I'll take <laughs> I'll, them. I'll, I'll take those odds. Those are pretty awesome. Uh, we're a third of the way through. So just a reminder, everyone, you're listening to the No CD Wednesday night webinar brought to you by No CD, a downloadable app you can get through Google Play or iOS. Please check us out on your favorite app store. And if you're looking for teletherapy or education about OCD, or if you're also looking for maybe some treatment around the areas of hoarding or body focused repetitive behaviors or ticks, we've got that available too through No CD also. So if you want a free 15 minute call with us to check out if we might be able to assist you, reach out to us at www.nocd.com or just download the app and hit the therapist button. We'll be able to do that for you. All right. Brian says, Hey, Dr. McGrath, is there a test to see if the problem with OCD is in brain chemistry or environmental factors that initially caused the problem? Is full recovery possible? I'll take the first part of that. We don't have anything like that that says that it's one or the other. So no, there is nothing out there at the moment for that. But Stacy, I'd love to hear you talk about the idea of recovery and what does recovery from OCD mean? You talked a little bit about this at the beginning, but here's a direct question. So I think that it's it's great for you to, uh, you know, go yeah, on that a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't OCD love it if there was a brain test that could say, yes, you for sure have it. I know my OCD would love that for sure. Right. Um, but no, unfortunately not. Um, you know, I, my personal feeling is that it is a very much a brain disorder in my mind. You know, I treat it very similar to that with the ERP. Um, and some people, you know, need, need medication with that and that's okay too. Um, in terms of recovery though, I mean, I think, yeah, it's, it's possible. I see it every day, you know, at no CD, we see it every single day. I, I, I tell people hundreds of hundreds, and I'm sure Dr. McGrath has seen many more people, but hundreds of people, you know, and, and I can't think of hardly anyone who doesn't get better. And if they don't, it's, it's usually because they've decided that, that, that they're not ready for the treatment at that time. So recovery is possible and, and, and there's lots of people living in it and, and it looks different for everyone. But I think it is right now what you're doing when you have OCD, the way you're living is hard. You know, I think most of you, most of you out there who have OCD know that this is not a easy road to travel. Um, people often think, well, ERP is going to be so much harder. It, it's not. I promise you it's not. It's hard and it's going to be hard up front. But it leads to freedom, whereas what you're doing now is just this endless cycle. Yeah, there's also, too, the aspect of treatment where OCD interferes in OCD treatment. OCD says, oh, you want to get rid of me? All right, well, here's how you got to do it. You have to do it perfectly and you have to follow my rules. But if you do that, then I'll go away, which makes it then impossible to follow the rules of OCD to get rid of OCD. So it's another trap that OCD sets to be able to stick around for as long as possible and not go away. OCD does not want to go away because OCD and Stacey, please correct me if, if you feel that this is not the way that you experienced it. But OCD almost has this notion of, hey, I'm your friend and I'm here to help you. And if you just do the things I tell you to do, all will be well and everything will be great. So let's just do these compulsions and bam, you won't have to worry about anything because you have done the compulsions and neutralized all the bad things and then nothing bad will happen. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I um, I think it's like the master tormentor. I don't know. It's like, it's like so smart. OCD has a brain of its own and it's like, just as soon as you think you've tr tricked it, it turns the tables. And so, I mean, it's always going to latch onto something, you know? Um, yeah. I, I see somebody saying, you know, aren't there brain scans of people with OCD? I do tell people that there are, but most people will never get those, right? There's, those are usually, um, 
I don't know. I, I always say they're they're really expensive tests that nobody really gets. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. And That's I can tell say, you but. from being on the scientific advisory board of the International OCD Foundation, nobody on that board will say that you can get a brain scan and it will say definitively, oh, you have OCD just sure. by looking at a brain scan. No, that 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 just is not there yet. Barring what you might hear in certain kinds of commercials or anything like that, if if I were to talk to the lead psychiatrist right now uh, on that group, they would say, we're not there yet, right? We just aren't there yet. So. Angel Ortega says, good evening. Do you continue to do the same ERP even on good days? And for how long should I continue to do ERP even after anxiety has gone down? Thank you. Uh, yes, and always. Uh, I, I just think it never hurts to do an ERP exercise every single day, right? Just just as as a, if anything, a way to keep it a habit, right? A way to continuously remind you that uh, OCD may try to rear its ugly head up again now and, and then. So you're always going to be doing good exercises as a way to make sure it doesn't do. What do you think on that, Stacey? Yeah, I, I love that because um, one of the things I tell people is uh, every day something comes up that is something related to OCD and I have a choice to make every day, right? Do I, do I left tap that? Do I, you know, um, do I, do I, do I touch that? And if, if OCD tells me to do it, I do the opposite, you know, and, and I try to do that more often than not. That's the key. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know anybody who can do everything a hundred percent of the time. Maybe there are some people out there like that. I'm not one. So there are days that I don't, or times where I give in to OCD still, the, the key for me is more times than not, I don't, right? More times than not, if OCD tells me left touch something, I right touch it, right? Or um, this is dirty, don't eat it, I eat it, right? And I see what happens. There are times, there are times I don't, but um, the majority of the time, it's almost kind of, I kind of make it a game. I, I don't know, this might be weird, but I sort of make it a game. Like who can, who can outwin, right? Like who has stronger willpower? And so I once told my doctor, um, who said, you know, why are you doing the work you're doing? Like, don't you have enough stress in your life? And I said, mm. I said, no, I said, I said, I do. And I get where you're coming from. But at the same time, like, no, I'm not going to not do something just because of OCD. Like, if anything, that's going to make me want to do it even more. Um, which I don't know, maybe that's just me being a pain in the butt, but go ahead. Be a pain in the butt to OCD. That's what I say. Be, it seems be to a work. pain in the butt. To, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, it's taken way too much of my time already. That that's the point I'm at now, you know, and, and people on here were talking about their children. And the other thing I, I don't often talk about is I have three children and two of which have been diagnosed with OCD. So as you can imagine, I am a big, strong believer in genetics and, and their mm -hmm. role in this as well. Um, but, you know, that is the main thing I tell them is, is, you know, don't let it steal those years. And I know it's not a choice, but you get to choose what you do with it, right? Like, they're lucky enough, fortunate enough, whatever, to have me who can recognize it fairly early on and treat it. And so one of the things I always, people always want to know is like, well, what, you know, what do you tell your old self or whatever? And I always say it's it's time. You can't get that back, you know. Um, so so each day that you're giving into the compulsions and doing them, you're losing time. You, you, you know, I don't know. I don't know if that made sense. It did in my head. It, it absolutely makes sense. <laughs> um, it absolutely makes sense. And I'm again, I I always appreciate having someone on who is very open and honest about their experience of OCD because, you know, hopefully people know that I'm coming from a place that I have, I have one enemy in the world that I can't stand. That's OCD. And I'm going to do all that I can to help people get rid of it. But, um, I, I think there's just a different level of hearing from someone who's gone through the whole experience as well, too. So I always appreciate that and, and, uh, think that our, our audience benefits from that as well, too. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Alex says, can support groups like the NoCD community become a compulsion? I find myself looking for reassurance. I'm not alone, but I also really do love the app and support groups. I just don't want a setback. Yeah, well, first of all, 
Uh, remember, anything can be doubted, right? So now it can be like, oh, look, support groups, great. Ah, but what if, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what if, now what if I need that and I'm using that too much and anything? So um, when whenever there's a question, and, and Stacy, tell me what your OCD would say to this, right? That says, can blank become a compulsion or can blank be a part of OCD? My answer is almost always, yep, <laughs> you know, it, 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 can it? Sure, right? So now what do you do to make sure that it isn't becomes becomes the thing. I mean, I've even had people who say, you know what? I love watching the Wednesday show, but I wanted to make sure that I didn't have to watch the Wednesday show. Yeah. Wednesday show. So now what I do is I flip a coin and if it's heads, I'll watch it. And if it's tails, I don't. Right. <laughs> and just to be able to make sure that, okay, I don't have to keep watching the, the webinar every Wednesday with you, even though we would love it if everybody did, but we don't want people to do it if <laughs> they feel it's becoming a compulsion. Right. So I think you can always approach things from that angle, but but um, how how did that work for you at times? Like, where's, did it ever feel, again, as I said earlier, OCD loves to take over treatment as well, too. So did that kind of ever yeah, have a we, theme for you or anything? First off, let me say, I'm old. So 20 years ago, there was not these cool webinars. There was not this awesome internet with all of these resources. I wish so badly. There you were. can't be that old, Stacey. Shut up. I am. Seriously, no. it was 20 years. I'm 42. I'm, all right. Well, all right. Look at I'm that. an old lady. But, <laughs> but truthfully, I wish there was all of this, but maybe, maybe not, right? Maybe I would have got sucked into that vortex of, of compulsions that way. Um, Gosh, I totally forgot what I was going to say. I had something really insightful planned to say. Um, I'm going to have to go with my second best answer, which is, um, yeah, it could, anything's a compulsion, right? But what I always ask myself is, does this bring me joy? <laughs> Who's that lady on TV who says that? There's like a lady, Marie something, and you hold uh, it close. Marie Kondo, I think it is. So, or something, something thank like you. That. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. To hold it close. So, so think of it this way. Does the support group bring you joy? <laughs> if it does, mm -hmm. then it's probably okay, right? As long as you're not looking. And if you know that you're looking for reassurance, which I suspect in these support groups, I've heard they're wonderful and amazing. I'm sure they're going to call that out, right? I'm, I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure they're not going to let that fly. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, in my mind, if this is something that is more helpful to you than not, then, then yeah, it's probably OCD, right? Um, and another thing I always tell people is, you know, when there's a sense of urgency that I need to know this, right? This, I have to have an answer it's a good sign you don't really need an answer, right? Like this, like, it, what if this is a compulsion or what if I need to know, right? Maybe it is and maybe you'll mess up and, and do some compulsions, right? We hope not. But once you get fixated on that, then it does become that, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I think it's always, again, run it by your therapist, right? If you're working with somebody, run it past them and just make that a part of the treatment then and make some decisions yeah. around that. You know, uh, you will, you will decide to only go to X number of support groups instead of Y number of support groups this month and just see what it's like. And if, and if you don't do it and your OCD flares up a bit, then you might know, okay, now, that doesn't mean I can't go to support groups anymore. What it means is I'm going to change the way I, I approach support groups, maybe, you know, like, um, and maybe I'll do an ERP exercise while I'm doing the support group, or I'll approach that as an ERP experience as well, too. So you can definitely build that into the whole experience if you want to. Yeah, I like that. Tiago says, after a long time with medium to low OCD symptoms, just relapsed to one of my oldest OCD topics, which involves false memory and real event OCD, started doing some stressful checking again. Because this theme is kind of old, I can't even define properly what I'm afraid of, just flashes of thoughts, fear, guilt, and confusion. I just forgot what it was like to be that low and can't figure out if there's anything. No, I can't just figure it out. Um, yeah, again, yeah, I did an entire hour on this at 11 Central today. So you can find it on the International OCD Foundation website. Chris Tronson and I had an entire discussion on this area today. But uh, here's what I here's what I hope, right? Just because this is flashed up again, uh, obviously it's going to feel bad and you're going to be disappointed. You know, that that's going to be natural. But don't let it get you down to the point that OCD is going to take over again and start winning. You know, this is this is the point to double up and be like, oh, all right, 
Time to go back to some ERP around those things. Stacy, were there times that that happened with you where, you know, you thought you were doing great for a while and then all of a sudden, bam, there's this thing that just kind of pops back. Yeah, for sure. Um, I always tell people, you know, you're never back at square one. It's impossible. You can't undo everything you've already done. You can't undo the learning. You can't undo the progress. The thoughts may come back with a vengeance, right? They may try to creep back up, but you're never back where you were. You're always moving forward with it, especially if you know ERP and, and you keep up with it. You just get right back on track. Um, I'm reminded of, of, of a story Um for, for whatever it's worth to people who are going through this false memory, real event stuff. Um, there was a time in my life where, this is so silly, but this is OCD, right? I collected every single receipt. Uh, if I did leave my house, I had every single receipt. And if you know me at all, I don't keep anything. I'm like the anti keeper of things. I, I give everything away because I can't stand clutter. So mm -hmm. Long story short, I went through this phase of probably two, three years where um, I wouldn't really leave much my house because of these fears I wouldn't remember if I had done something bad. So long story short, um, my biggest fear spanning all of the themes has always been, what if I convince myself of something that wasn't true? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter what the theme is. It's more this idea that my mind is so powerful that it would convince me that I've either done something or that something bad had happened and I wouldn't remember. So I kept all of these receipts. And the reason I did it was because then I would have a timeline if I should start to believe that something happened, right? I could say, oh, well, you know, I ran through the McDonald's drive through at, you know, you know 5 a.m. or whatever it was. Um, and in my mind, that made a lot of sense, right? But again, it's that doubt. It's that idea that somehow something, it's something to latch on to because just that know it, that knowledge alone was a compulsion, right? It made me feel better temporarily. Um, but, you know, pretty soon you have 5,000 receipts and you've never been accused of a thing in your life, right? Yeah. Um, but again, I think that one is one of the scariest things. So I, I guess I feel for people who have that really strongly because um, that's a hard one, right? And and I seen somebody else had a question about, well, what about people who really maybe did do something bad in the past? Um, and then how do you deal with that, right? And that one's always a tough one because uh, nobody's perfect. Everybody does things, right? And so um, most of the time, the people I've worked with will say, you know, well, I was a kid and I did this or I did that. And it's like, yeah, yeah you were a kid. That That's what they do. Um, but remember, OCD wants to torture you and, and make you think about that and try to figure it all out. We know the more you review past memories, the less accurate they become, right? right. Um, so it's a trap. It's just a trap. And of course... You should have known then everything that you know now, even though you were four and could barely read, you yes. should have known theoretical physics at that point and known that yeah. if you did this thing, that it would somehow cause this kind of other difficulty for you uh, later on in your life or some, you know, something just absolutely ridiculous of that, of that kind of nature. Yeah. In your yeah. So yeah, hundred, hundred percent. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting too. I love the receipt story, by the way. Love that. I mean, yeah, I don't know if I've ever told example. that one. Honestly, I, I that might be a Wednesday night webinar special. There we go. There, there we go. go. Yes. Deluxe edition, even. Yes. Uh, maybe. Yes. Yeah. Very but insightful. I think what it does is it really illuminates one of the things in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM five that we use right now, where in OCD it says the compulsions need not necessarily on the surface be, seem to be related to what the obsessions are. Yeah. So most people would say, how the heck is having a couple of receipts from the day going to prove to you that <laughs> yeah. you didn't do X, Y, or Z, but in your mind it did. And therefore yes. it became a compulsion. And even though maybe no one else can really ever truly understand, and maybe even now looking back, you even have yeah. trouble understanding exactly <laughs> where your mindset was at that point in time. It but, allowed me to leave the house though, right? Yeah. That was my loophole. That's what OCD does. It will give you loopholes, right? Like you can leave your house if you'll just, this is to ensure that everybody's safe and, and you can go back, right? You can check even though that's that's outlandish, right? 
Yeah. And I love what you said too. And I want to repeat it. The more we track, the more we check, the less confidence we have. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Amor says, how do you get over the theme of one upmanship in OCD? Uh, I'm not quite sure what that means. So let me just see if uh, it comes up uh, and we get kind of an explanation on that uh, going forward. All right. Uh, Svet says, hi, Patrick. Hello. Uh, how does one differentiate critical thinking about an uncomfortable situation slash about a fear from a mental compulsion, right? So, um, Sved, I would say this. Uh, uh, some critical thinking might happen once or twice or maybe a couple times. Mental compulsions can go on forever. Right? So, even if you come to a point in critical thinking, you're like, oh man, yeah. And now I've got an answer. I'm going to go with that. And that's how I'm going to approach things in the future. And maybe now and then it'll pop back up and there might be kind of a little bit extra review or something like that, but you're going to move forward. Versus a compulsion is, oh man, I got to really think about that when I got to come with an answer. And then you'll come with an answer like, oh, okay, okay. And then a few minutes later, I uh, might have to do that again. And then you'll come up with the answer again. Oh, okay, okay. And then a few minutes later, oh, I think I got to do that again. Uh, but Stacy, how about for you? You know, how have you yourself living with this? I'm sure you've had some critical thinking, difficult decisions to make in your life. How did you do those without OCD interfering with them? And, and how have you been able to define when something is and when something is not OCD when it comes down to it, a really yeah. important topic? Maybe. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's a, that's a great question. I think OCD just has a flavor. And I think you, the longer you have it, the more you know how to differentiate it, right? It's like you learn its its ways, you know? And, and I'd be lying if I said I, in everything I do, it seems like there's doubts, you know? Um, there came a time in my life, though, where I said, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to make a choice, and either way, it'll work out or it won't, and then I'll start over. So, so I don't know if that makes sense, but if it's critical thinking, then okay, then it'll work out. If it's, if it's an obsession, you know, it's just going to keep coming back around. I don't know if that made sense, but, um, at some point you just make a decision and you, you go for it, you know, and, and that kind of puts an end to the rumination, right? Either you yeah. it either works or it doesn't at the end of the day, you know, it's a false sense of security to think that, to think that me thinking about something long enough is going to actually really change something right mm -hmm. um it's sort of that magical thinking idea right at some point you just make a decision or you just do something you know it's i don't know if that's there is a leap of of uh i didn't want to say leap of faith but there, there's a leap of uh maybe acceptance of uncertainty that yes. someone will finally do and say oh um i don't Radical need to review acceptance. this anymore right yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. it's time to it's time to just go with with what I got going here. Okay. Uh, I I think this will be interesting for you. I love your I would love your take on this. Lisa says, okay. "Hello, I found that my OCD gets triggered by one thing and then it can just start spiraling onto a bunch of other things." Yeah, that's our friend OCD. I mean, that sounds very familiar for sure, for sure. And I think what's always surprising to me is the things that it can latch onto. There are some things um that don't bother me at all. You know, I'm, I'm like uh, the most carefree person about, but then there are things that I know other people don't even think twice about. And I can think about it for days on end. You know, it's, it's, I don't know why. I don't know why. I've just accepted that it is, that's how OCD works and it, it likes to upset you. And so, yeah, it just, it, it has, you know, for me, I said, I think the root for me has been this idea that I'm somehow all powerful and can control things. And, and, um, you know, my mind could convince me of things. And then that's just sort of branched off into 5 million other little things. But at the end of the day, I think most people's have the same root fears, which is I doubt who I am. I doubt myself and what I'm capable of. Um, and sort of that, that overall sense of, I don't know, right. I don't know, I don't have control, you know? And so 
it doesn't really matter the theme. I know it feels like it does in the moment. We get really caught up in themes. I know. Um, I see this on our community page. I see this through, you know, Instagram and things. And themes are important in that they help with treatment. But ultimately, it's always the same underlying stuff, right? You want to know with 100% certainty something. And it's usually about yourself. It's usually something you care a whole lot about. And it usually is something that's going to make you feel pretty crummy, right? And so it really doesn't matter what it latches onto or why, you know, people always want to know, well, why? It doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, it's still the same treatment, you know, right? you, you accept uncertainty. And so often a why is, well, once you find something to be meaningful or important, OCD says, ah, but what if? Yeah. Yeah. Which, which goes right into thanks you question. My OCD is always around the what ifs. Do you know how to stop this? Uh, I love this question because I have talked about the phrase what if for years and years now. This has been one of my my go to things. You can define anxiety and OCD by two words. And those two words are what if followed by the worst case scenario that you can possibly think of. And then what if always comes along with what if's cousin and what if's cousin is yeah, but what if. Right. So. You know, I'll say to you, Stacey, well, what if this? And you'll give me a wonderfully logical answer. And then I'll say, yeah, but what if this? And then you'll give me another uh -huh. wonderfully uh -huh. logical answer. And then, yeah, but what if this? And, mm -hmm. and and it's just not going to go anywhere, right? We're just spinning our wheels. We're on the hamster wheel of hell. We're just going around and around and around. And nothing good is coming out of the whole experience, right? So it is time to help people to recognize one thing. You don't have to answer every what if that pops into your head. So that, that thank, thanks you is one of my first pieces of advice for you, which is this, just because you have a, what if doesn't mean it deserves any attention whatsoever. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because boy, OCD. And, and again, Stacy, tell us from your point of view, OCD believes that everything that pops into your head is amazingly important and real and truthful and deserves a ton of attention. Yes. Yes, it does. It does. And, you know, it's so funny, the what if thing. Um, um, I, I, I just wrote an article and I think I called it the what if game. But but yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, it really becomes this. But what if this and what if this, you know, when I was a kid, I would confess something and then I'd go back to my room and then I'd say, but what about this? Did you really say everything you said? Did you say it like you said it the first time? And it's just this constant, constant spinning of wheels. I like somebody on here said accepting the worst case scenario uh, is the key to recovery. That's so true. I always say, play it out, play it out. And that's what my therapist used to do with me a lot. He'd say, you know, okay, well then if that's true, then what, then what, then what? And eventually it always came down to, okay, yeah, that would suck. That would be horrible and I would hate it and life would go on. Right. And so I, I try to be mindful of that even to this day, you know, um, Sometimes, sometimes bad things happen. I mean, unfortunately, we live in a world where bad things happen. Um, but absolutely, we're not immune to anything bad happening, right? No. And nor are we trying to become immune to bad things happening. That's not the goal either. We're trying to recognize that when something bad happens, we have the ability to handle it. And OCD joining into that mix of trying to handle it only makes it worse, doesn't make it better. I mean, right. if it, that uh, too many cooks in the kitchen uh, phrase. Once OCD enters the kitchen, it's it's as if someone has thrown uh, nine thousand pounds of the worst seasonings into the the soup that you can possibly add to it, and now it's just crap, right? And but OCD says, "Oh no, it's not crap. It's awesome. How can you not see it? Let me prove it to you, right?" And yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's what it does. I I. I want to say this just because I think it's important. Well, please do go right ahead. Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, in, in talking and stuff, you know, I wasn't going to talk about this, but I, I often say out of all my fears and believe me, the ones I talk about are, are only the tip of the iceberg, but, um, but again, it doesn't really matter what the themes are. It just doesn't. Um, only one thing has happened that I was afraid of, and that was the death of my mom, right? That's a very common one, the death of a parent, the death of a loved one. Um, and it happened. And you know what? 
it's okay. Like I got through it. I'm still going through it. Of course, that's sure. something I think you'll be with, will be with you forever, but it's important because I never, ever in a gazillion years would have ever thought I could have gotten through it. I was convinced the day that happened would be the end of my life. And so I think that's important to realize that even though I really, truly believed that for 36 years, that that that, that would be it, like that was it. It wasn't it. The story goes on. And so I just want to leave sort of people with that, that, that I know your fear feels like the very worst fear in the world because that's OCD is like your own your own personal brand of venom. I kind of yeah. like that. Oh, uh, I might use that again. There's your next article. Yeah, right yeah. There. yeah. Your mm -hmm. own. I gotta. I gotta remember that one. But your own personal brand of venom. I yeah, like yeah. I think mm -hmm. I could do something with that. Venom. I think so too. Um. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I I'm fresh off a, a a Twilight marathon with my kids, and I think <laughs> I think that might have been. He said maybe maybe the main vampire said something like that. But I digressed. Sorry. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Can I can I go somewhere with and is it okay just to yeah. talk about your mom for a minute? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, of yeah. course, no, for the loss of your of course, yeah. Um OCD almost wants to convince you no one else has ever had a mom like you've had, and therefore only you would truly experience the loss so bad because uh, how could you lose a mom like your mom, right? Or, yeah. or sure, other people have lost their moms, but they just didn't have, feel as close to them as I feel as close to my mom or something she like that. She would really right? like you right now. <laughs> <laughs> She'd be like, he's wonderful. <laughs> yes. Um, and and in opposite, and and for any of you going to the International OCD Foundation Conference, which will be in Denver in a couple of weeks, I was working with someone once who had a fear that if they had an intrusive thought about their parents or an image or an urge that involved them, they would have to say a prayer because if they didn't, then their parents would die. So I proceeded to write down on a card that is still in my wallet, which I will be bringing to the conference. And on that card, it says, I hope my parents die tonight. And then I put a please God. And then I put a 666 on the card as well, too. Now, I did that 17 years ago, and my parents are still alive. Now, they will die at some point. It is going to happen. I am not at all convinced that they will live uh, forever, though they may tell me, haha, now that you've wrote that card, just to spite you, we will live forever. But that, that isn't going to happen. Right? So, um, and when they do die, I will not for a millisecond think maybe the card had something to do with it, right? Because even if I hadn't written that card, it would have happened anyway. So I will say, I remember hearing that story when I first started working for an OCD and I mm. had a miniature panic attack. I did. <laughs> I was like, oh dear God, that's so awful. But again, you know, I, I have OCD and logically I know the two are not connected, but there's that feeling, right? And that's yeah. what we're fighting against with OCD is don't, don't listen to the feelings as hard as that is. Cause I think that's what most of us do, right? We live based off our feelings, but OCD will give you not, not correct feelings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not great stuff. Yeah. Uh, Caleb says, this is refreshing to hear. I have had the same obsessions as Stacy. So thank you for that. Uh, Brian says thoughts that say you don't really love things you love. And when you enjoy things you do thoughts say you won't enjoy this good moment ever again. Is there ERP for this and how to keep enjoying life again? I'm sure you went through some of those kinds of experiences, Stacey, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you're right. I think OCD will come and will try to steal the joy and try to get you not to enjoy living in the moment because you're always thinking of what if this happens in the future and how you can control it, right? Um, there's no easy answer except you have to still do life, right? Like, um, that's one of the things I tell myself all the time, like everything I wouldn't have done before, I feel like I have to do now, you know, simple things, you know, I, um, I avoided water, <laughs> another secret out of my, in my, um, past, but I avoided water because I was so afraid people were drowning. <laughs> like, like as if everywhere I went, people would be drowning and I had to, I had to be aware of that and, and alert whomever. Right. Um, so I wouldn't go near water. I love water. 
Um, and I remember the first time I got like in a canoe and how horrible that was because, you know, there's people and you're thinking, well, what if I see somebody under the water or something like that, you know? And then of course, OCD with that memory stuff will say, but did you? Maybe you did when it's really just like a twig, seriously, or a yeah. fish or something. Um, <laughs> it's not mermaid, a mermaid. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's a mermaid. I don't know. Um but I, where was I going with that? It, I, I say that to say you can't let it stop you from, from living life, even if you don't feel like doing something. Because did I feel like getting in that canoe? No, I remember that day. I did not want to go canoeing. And I said, enough's enough. I'm not, I'm not going to live in a prison. So, Yeah. OCD can feel like a mental prison for a lot of people. Right? For sure. For sure. Mercy says, can you talk about real event OCD in tandem with moral scrupulosity? Boy, again, this morning, Chris Tronson and I had this great discussion about this. So let me recrap. Recrap. <laughs> there we go. Recrap. There we are. Uh, I'm going to recrap everyone. Here. Let me recap that. Uh, sorry. And um, basically, yes, of course. And here's why. When you have real event issues or false memory kinds of issues, you basically think, what if I forgot something about an event? Or or what if, yes, I know I did the event, but how do I know that I actually did it the way that I did it? And this goes to your receipts kind of, Stacey as well too, a little bit as well there, right? Yeah. And so um, what must be then could or could be, but but could becomes must be in, in OCD, of course, in this kind of situation. I must have done something awful or horrible because even though I don't mem remember it, I'm sure that I probably did. Yeah. And and it's only by having exact memory and exact knowledge will I be able to have the guarantee that uh, I did not do something terrible or awful or horrible. So a hundred percent, you can see the fear around what if what if I did something horrible? I don't remember that I did. I mean, people are going to find out about it. I'll be judged or evaluated about it as well, too. We will, we will absolutely see those kinds of of relationships there. Yep. Yeah. Um, CC says, going off real event OCD. I typically see people talking about real event OCD in terms of things the OCD sufferer did. What about things that happened to the OCD sufferer? Yes, that can be as well too. You know, do do we remember everything that happened? Do we do we remember in exactly the right way? We we know that OCD you know can cloud memory about things, and and here's one of the very basic reasons why is because when you're so anxious about something that you experience, it's hard to encode things because you're not in the part of the brain working as well that really would encode all the stuff going on. You're more in that fight, flight, or freeze response mode. And when you're in that, your brain has one goal, which is get the heck out of here or beat the crap out of whoever's in front of you or freeze and hope nobody notices you, right? That's really what you're focusing on. So then it becomes very difficult to actually focus on what's going on in the environment when that's actually happening internally for you. So it would be like this. Have a cheetah chase after you, but do complex math in your head while it's happening, right? Very, very difficult to do <laughs> in that kind of situation, right? Because you're now trying to engage your brain to do in competitive types of responses. So it's never surprising that people are, are afraid about not knowing something about maybe what they did or what actually happened or something like that, because they might have, in the moment of it going on, already been in kind of an OCD or fight, flight, or freeze response anyway. And even people without OCD, often um, there's a lot of studies out there about their memories being not very great either. I mean, it, uh, a lot of people don't remember their their childhoods accurately anyways. Um, yeah. A lot of our memories come from what people have told us and pictures and things like that. So that's really not just an OCD thing, but I think we get stuck on it a whole lot more than somebody who doesn't have OCD. Elizabeth S. says, definitely possible recover. I've been at no CD for a year and it's not gone, but it's so much more manageable and recognizable. No CD is amazing. I don't know where I'd be without this place. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for saying that. We appreciate it very yes, much. Yes, yes. Um, Stacy, are there any other things that you wanted to say? We're, we're coming up on the last minutes here. So I always love to give our wonderful guests an opportunity to, uh, you know, uh, have have the floor and just let people know whatever it is you think is important for them to know. 
Oh, so much responsibility there. Wow. I don't even know what to say. Um, no, I appreciate that I got to finally come on um, a webinar with you. And I love all the interaction of people. I love when we hear the stories of people getting better because I do see it every day. I, I truly, um, there's very few people that that don't drastically improve with with ERP. Um, and it, it's been life changing in my life. And and truly, um, that's the only reason I tell my story is so that so that other people can see you can live a very fulfilling life. You know, OCD is a part of my life, but it really is such a small part now. Um, I obviously I talk about it and I work with it. But other than that, it really is such a tiny part. Um, and, yeah. and, and I'm not special. I always make sure I tell people that there is nothing special about me. And I mean that in the bestest way. <laughs> Anybody can do it. it. It really isn't, you know, it isn't something, well, you know, you're a therapist and you did it. No, I wasn't a therapist. I went to this because of my experience. And so um, it really is choosing. I'm not going to do this anymore. I, I love it when people come to me at No CD and say, I'll do anything. I will not live another day like this because yeah. then I know game on, like we're going to do this because that's where you got to almost be to, to get there. And then you got to stay there <laughs> every awesome. day. Well, if you'd love to work with an awesome therapist like Stacy, reach out to us at nocd.com and set up a free 15 minute call with us for work on OCD or body focused repetitive behaviors, hoarding, or if you're looking for education about OCD for yourself or a friend or a family member, we'd love to provide that to you as well too. Thank you once again, everyone for joining us. Download the NoCD app and the Google Play or iOS. It's free. Join our community, the largest online community of people with OCD in the world. So check us out. Thanks for joining everyone. We'll see you again next week.